this session of Look at the Book, I'd like to focus on this passage in Mark 10, 42 to 45, with a special focus on the argument of verse 45 that's introduced by this word for, and then compare it to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20, let's see, 18 to 21. And the reason for this is to show the relationship between Jesus and his teaching and the uh, later Christian church teaching. Because sometimes people say the simplicity of Jesus was that he was just a, a wise and good Jewish teacher that inspired a great following, but the later Christian church messed it up and turned it into this supernatural atonement thing with a dying and rising Christ and a substitution and all that bloody mess on the cross. And I want us to see the relationship between Mark, where we meet this Jesus, and Peter, where we meet the later church teaching. That's the first thing. And then the second thing I want us to see is how um, Jesus, as a servant, relates to uh, our servanthood. And that will lead us to how then do we um, understand the cross and what was really done on the cross. So, Father, as we tackle these three things and try to be faithful to your word here, would you open our eyes so that we see what Jesus actually accomplished and how it relates to our calling to live radical lives of humble service of others rather than selfishness? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jesus is responding now to uh, the desire of the disciples to be in one place of glory or another. And he says, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not, not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So instead of lording it over servanthood, instead of exercising authority over slave of all, and then comes this all-important argument. Because all of this is because even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what's the argument? There are two pieces. Here's the first one, and here's the second one. The first reason that we should be slave of all and servant of all rather than lording it over each other is because the Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, came into the world from his exalted position at God's right hand not to be served. He wasn't trying while he was here to get people to meet his needs. He was going to meet other people's needs. He served us. And then the second thing, so this is this we might call um, imitation. Right? He gave us an example so that we might imitate him. He he was a great servant. Instead of lording it over, we are called to be great servants. So he died on the cross in service to us that we might imitate his sacrifice and be like him. Then it says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now that's not imitation. That's something we can't do. This is done for us. This is, you could call it atonement or substitution or um, ransom is what he says 
or reconciliation, meaning when this ransom is paid, when our debt is paid, we don't have the wrath of God against us anymore. We don't have guilt anymore. We don't have hell looming in front of us anymore. In other words, this ransom paid for us rescues us from our horrific condition of being captive to sin and judgment under God's righteous wrath. So two huge things were achieved by Jesus that make us servants of each other. One, he became an example for us. He, he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And that's what we're to do. And he was a ransom for many. Now, let's go compare this logic and this double argument to what Peter made of it years later in teaching the churches. 1 Peter 2, 18 to 21. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So he's calling servants to be real, humble, submissive, supportive, sacrificial, self-denying servants. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly like Jesus did. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So he's calling these servants here to take a, a lowly, humble, submissive, suffering, enduring position and serve rather than get their back up, which they have a right to do, on human terms, and humbly serve their masters, even the unjust ones. And then here's the argument. Four. And my argument is, what I'm pointing out is that that four is the same as this four right here. For even the Son of Man came, supporting our being servants rather than lording it over. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. So there we have imitation. Leaving you an example. So clearly Christ suffered with a view to show us how to live our lives. And that's what a lot of liberals who don't believe in the supernatural think Jesus did. That's all he did. Jesus was a great teacher, a wonderful example, and we should try to live lives that imitate Jesus. And that's a half-truth, because here's the other piece. To this you have been called, for Christ suffered for you, not just like you, he suffered for you, which is the same ransom idea that we had back in Mark 10. And we know this word for means something like substitute or ransom because just, a, what, three verses later, 224, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying in your sin like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And this is a quote. By his wounds, you have been healed is a quote from Isaiah 53. And you were straying. That's a quote from Isaiah 53, where we read, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. 
This is a beautiful description, 700 years before it happened, of the substitutionary, sin-bearing work of Jesus on the cross. So we go back now, and here's what I want to point out. When you consider the relationship between Jesus and the later Christian church, remember that both in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, in Mark 10, and in 1 Peter 2, you have a very similar argument. Christians are to be sacrificial, self-denying servants of others, willing to die, willing to give up their own preferences for the eternal good of others because of two things. Namely, Jesus became an example for us to imitate, and Jesus became a substitute. He atoned for our sins. He ransomed. He reconciled us to God so that there's no wrath. And when you ask about the relationship between this part and this part, the answer surely is we can't even begin to imitate Jesus as we ought until our sins are paid for. If we are operating under guilt and under judgment and under condemnation, there's no way we will have the resources to deny ourselves and love others the way we should. And therefore, we embrace the cross as our reconciliation with God so that we might be able to imitate the Lord Jesus. And there is a beautiful harmony and unity and consistency between the Old Testament promise, the teachings of Jesus, and the later teachings of the early church.